Every now and then, an idea takes form that changes everything. It revolutionizes the way we see and understand the world around us. I believe that just such an idea took form in the medieval Islamic world. It's the idea that everything from the stars above to the workings of our own bodies is not arbitrary or whimsical, but subject to certain systematic rules. And what's more, that we humans can work out what those rules might be. And then we can refine and test our theories through observation and experiment. In other words, it's the idea we now call the scientific method. For me, the story of the scientific renaissance that took place in the medieval Islamic world is a personal one. This is my cousin Samir's house in the Iranian capital Tehran. I haven't seen some of the relatives on my father's side of the family in over 30 years. This is my not so tall but very beautiful auntie Elisa. The Al-Khalili family is originally from the city of Nejef in Iraq, south of Baghdad. In fact, I grew up in Iraq. But when Saddam Hussein came to power, the family split. Many of the Al-Khalilis fled here to Iran. As my mother's English, I came to Britain with my parents. There, I pursued my passion for science and I'm now a professor of physics at the University of Surrey. But now I find that my own scientific work and my Arabic and Islamic heritage are intertwined. On my journey through the Middle East, I discovered that an astonishing leap in scientific knowledge took place here a thousand years ago under a powerful and flourishing Islamic empire. Wealthy, powerful, successful cultures will produce enormous advances in understanding and in technique. And that's just what we find in Islam, in Baghdad, under a series of successful, powerful, wealthy and self-confident Islamic regimes. Over a thousand years ago, the Islamic empire was the largest in the world. It governed an estimated 60 million people. That was over 30% of the world's population. I found an archaeological fragment of this glorious past in a suburb of Tehran, not far from my cousin's house. These ancient walls, tucked behind a back street on the outskirts of southern Tehran, are literally all that remain of the ancient city of Ray, the city that the great Persian geographer al muqaddisi described as one of the glories of Islam. Of course, Ray was just one of a number of cities that flourished under early Islamic rule. From Baghdad, its capital, the empire spread across thousands of miles, from North Africa through to Central Asia. Cities like al Askar, Basra, Merv, Gurganj, Bukhara, each powerful and thriving cities. Each would have been rich in trade, alive with culture. Each would have had its own libraries, its own academies. These were powerhouses of the new science. This really was a golden age. Think of that span of land. This is larger than any empire human civilization had ever known. Within that span of land, you can plug in the Roman Empire, and it will fill just maybe, what, one third of it, one half of it, or something like that. Reminders of this great Islamic empire are everywhere in the Arab world today. This football match in the Syrian capital, Damascus, is being played at the Abbasid Stadium. 
That's the name of the family who ruled the Islamic Empire from 750 to 1258 AD. <laughs> this large territory allowed them to raise enormous tax revenues to fund a search for knowledge and scholarship, which became known as the Translation Movement. They sent scholars around the known world to gather up great books and have them translated into Arabic. It's a legacy that's still alive in the minds of most modern Arabs. For medieval Islamic leaders, scientific knowledge was crucial to successfully running a vast empire. We did have a big and sophisticated governmental administration, and obviously that needed knowledge. If you wanted to be an administrator and you had to assess taxes, you needed to know about mathematics. It also wants to be able to build monumental buildings. That requires the knowledge of architecture and, again, mathematical skills to construct fine buildings safely. Medicine, just to keep the elite happy and healthy. And those are the areas of knowledge which are first translated from other languages into Arabic. The legacy of the medieval Islamic empire is scattered across a vast region. There's architectural masterpieces like the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, the Jama Mosque in Isfahan, and Al Azhar University Mosque in Cairo. And then there are many ruins that still hint at past glories, like this, a crumbling 8th century palace deep in the Syrian desert. And this, a huge Muslim palace called Medina to Zahra, currently being excavated in southern Spain. These are the impressive ruins of Medina to Zahra, the fantastic palace city built outside Cordoba in the 9th century by Abdurrahman III, who was the greatest of all the Andalusian caliphs. At the time that it was ruined, Cordoba was in fact the largest and most important city in Europe. Arrival to Baghdad in the east for a center for Islamic scholarship and science. And as I traveled, I saw how science, especially numerical record keeping and measurement, was crucial to dealing with the challenges of running a vast empire. This is the mighty River Nile, as it flows through the Egyptian capital, Cairo. Since antiquity, its unpredictable floods have determined the fate of Egypt's people, bringing years of lean and plenty. By the 8th century, Cairo was part of the Islamic Empire, and the new rulers took the first step to understanding this mighty river in a scientific way. They built a device to measure it. Dr. Nader al Bizri of the Institute of Ismaili Studies is showing me the Nihilometer. It's basically a huge colonnade that was built in a chamber connected by tunnels to the river. As the water rose or fell, its height could be read from the central column. The central colonnade here is.